One of the disappointing things for regional enthusiasts has been the absence of any evidence for an impact of regional anesthesia on postoperative delirium in the older patient. In the recent RAGA trial comparing spinal anesthesia and general anesthesia in hip fracture, the incidence of delirium was equivalent in both neuraxial and general anesthesia groups at about 6%. This raises the question of whether we need to turn our attention to the other components of a regional anesthetic apart from the block itself, in particular the sedation that is often administered in conjunction with the block. It's often said, tongue-in-cheek of course, that the greatest invention in regional anesthesia is propofol. But this may not be true after all. This large Korean randomized controlled trial compared intraoperative sedation with either propofol or dexmedetomidine in elderly patients undergoing elective orthopedic surgery of the lower limbs under spinal anesthesia. The patients were all relatively healthy, all ASA 1 to 2, with the most common comorbidities being hypertension and diabetes. The majority of patients had knee surgery, with a minority having hip or femur surgery and an average surgical time of 85 minutes with pretty minimal blood loss and no documented transfusions. No premedication was given for the spinal, in particular, no benzodiazepines or opioids. Now, once the spinal anesthetic was complete, sedation was initiated with either propofol or dexmedetomidine using the regimen that you see here. The administering anesthesiologist was not blinded to the medication and titrated the dose to achieve a score of 3 to 4 on the modified observer's assessment of alertness and sedation scale. Dexmedetomidine was stopped when wound closure was started, whereas propofol was stopped only 30 minutes later when wound closure was complete to account for the different pharmacokinetics of the two agents. Patients were assessed for postoperative delirium daily on postoperative days 1 through 3 using the confusion assessment method questionnaire. And what they found was that the incidence of postoperative delirium at any time during these three days was 3% in the dexmedetomidine group and more than double that in the propofol group at 6.6%. These findings are in line with reductions seen in other studies by different investigators in similar older patient populations. The baseline rate of 6% in the propofol group is also similar to that seen in the RAGA trial. But before we get too excited, it's important to note that most delirium was seen on postoperative day one and lasted less than two days in the majority. I think that's an important point. These were transient changes in cognition. And we also don't have granular data on how severe this delirium was. So we should be a little bit cautious about saying, let's all start switching to dexmedetomidine now. Because there are some downsides with dexmedetomidine. The first is cost at least in Canada at this time. And more importantly though is the effect that it has on hemodynamics. This is actually quite complex and nuanced. What the Korean group observed, which is consistent with the other studies, is that intraoperatively, dexmedetomidine results in lower heart rates as we might expect, although this did not get to a point where atropine had to be given. More interesting was the fact that mean arterial pressure intraoperatively was better preserved compared to the propofol group and the per unit time dose of phenylephrine required was lower. Again though, we should not read too much into it because mean arterial pressure was maintained above 60 millimeters mercury in the vast majority of patients without too much effort. Where it gets really interesting is what happens in the post-anesthetic care unit phase. And here, the patients in the dexmedetomidine group not only continue to have lower heart rates, but they now also have a lower mean arterial pressure compared to the propofol group. This echoes findings from a retrospective study recently published in the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia, and both this article and the accompanying editorial are worth reading. Essentially, what is likely happening is that dexmedetomidine has a more prolonged effect, carrying over into the PACU period despite stopping the infusion some 30 plus minutes earlier. Is this a problem? Perhaps, but perhaps not, as long as the PACU staff are aware of this and are vigilant and prepared to treat it with the appropriate vasopressors, recognizing the phenomenon for what it is. So the question is, what do we do with the results of this paper? Clearly, there is a reduction in the risk of postoperative delirium with dexmedetomidine versus propofol. But if we consider the clinical significance of the observed cognitive changes, and the trade-offs and possible harm that might arise if dexmedetomidine starts to be used on a wider scale, 
I might suggest that for now at least, the best possible use of dexmedetomidine is in selected patients who we deem at higher risk of significant delirium. Identifying those patients, though, is a whole other question. Here's one final thought, though. Perhaps we should also be asking whether or not we need to administer sedative drugs at all. There is a well-recognized phenomenon called sensory deafferentation dependent sedation. In this absence of any sensory input, brainstem activity quietens, and patients actually fall asleep much more readily. Most of us have probably seen this at some point in the elderly patient with a hip fracture who's received a spinal anesthetic. My recommendation, therefore, is that if you really want to minimize the risk of contributing to postoperative delirium in a patient who receives a surgical anesthetic block, especially a spinal, observe to see if they will fall asleep spontaneously before initiating pharmacological sedation. And if you do administer sedation, it may be reasonable to apply a depth of hypnosis monitor if it's available to you and use that to titrate the dose to avoid deep levels of hypnosis and suddenly avoid burst suppression.